here and here, and also uh, we can let them go in here. We just have to make certain we keep the, the live stream. And then also, also the front over here. So however they want to do that.
Please be seated. As I mentioned to some of those uh, who were here uh, much earlier, uh, I'm Pastor Dwayne, pastor here at the New York Arabian Church. I uh, just want to welcome all of you to our church here today. Uh, our first uh, funeral service uh, following the loosening up restrictions, so we're kind of trying to figure out how all this works, uh, even as we enter into this time of, of grief, but also celebrating a very precious life. So I thank you for your cooperation with us today. Uh, as things go, uh, what they tell us uh, are a couple of things. First of all, I thank you for wearing the masks. Uh, one of the other things that they say is that if I'm at least 12 to 15 feet away from you, uh, which means basically from here to the front, anyone who's on the platform or the dais up here uh, does not have to wear a mask. So that's the only reason I take mine off for today. Uh, but uh, I welcome all of you. Just some logistics. Uh, if you are in need of a restroom, there is one that is down the hall here to my right. At the end of the left, there's also restrooms in the basement below. You get to them through the stairs that are back here uh, to my left. Uh, also, uh, we're just going to be, most of the things that uh, we're going to be doing today are going to be projected onto the screen, uh, so don't worry too much. Uh, and uh, actually, I'm trying to remember all the things that I, I put in here uh, for where I'm going. Uh, but uh, again, on behalf of everyone at, here at the New York Moravian Church, we just want to welcome you but also to express our deepest sympathies to you today. Uh, it is, uh, has been my pleasure to get to know Larry just a little bit. Uh, and it was one of those things where uh, that's one of the things that he liked to do. He liked to meet new people. And, and actually, in some ways, in that respect, he reminds me of my mom. Uh, because when I read through the obituary that said he knew a lot of people, he said, I swore my mom knew everybody in town. Uh, and so, uh, you know, was, and my dad, being a plumber in a small town, my dad had been into everybody's house in town. Uh, but we are here to celebrate a very special life. Uh, I find that in times of death, one of the things that is most apparent is that we feel can feel very isolated and alone. Uh, that, and many times we are, we feel as though we are dealing with our grief. Uh, and our feelings and emotions all by ourselves, which makes, for me, the, my daily devotional all that much more important. Uh, back in the 1700s, the Moravian Church started a practice called the Daily Watchword. Uh, it was kind of a combination of a daily devotional, plus also an overnight check-in to see how your neighbors were doing. Uh, did everything go well over the night? And uh, as such, and so a, a scripture passage was selected for each day, and then the passage was then shared with every household in the community, and they would go from house to house, checking in and saying, how are you doing? Here's the passage to meditate on for today. That practice uh, continued, and then it became codified. They made, turned it into a written devotional, uh, and even today, 200, over 260 years later, we're still getting a text that is drawn for each day. Uh, and there are now over a million and a half copies of that daily text in print. And as I read the passages, what it does for me 
is it reminds me that no matter where I am, usually I am by myself in a quiet place to, to meditate on the Word. Uh, I'm reminded that there are many more who are joining with me, reading those same words, and reminding me that in my journey of faith, I am not alone. So as we gather here, know that you are not alone. You are a part of a large body of faith, and you, we are here in the presence of God. The passages that were selected for today, uh, and they each have a hymn verse that goes along with them. The watchword for today is from Isaiah 11. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the people. And a hymn verse, the word of God, a promise told, a king shall come, let all behold, the world awaits his presence new, a child, a son, savior, true. And the doctrinal text from the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, time of Jesus' baptism. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the hymn verse, Teach me to love you as your angels love, one holy passion filling all my frame. The baptism of the heaven-descended dove my heart an altar, and your love the flame. We now join together uh, in, in some hymns, but, and, oh my goodness, there it is. Uh, one thing I know is that singing with masks is quite difficult, and also too, uh, it's one where uh, sometimes I find that we don't always like to sing out loud, uh, but what I'm going to ask you to do, and sometimes as we sing, we don't always hear the words. And so for this first hymn, uh, and for the second that we'll have later, I'm going to try and experiment with you. Uh, my organist is going to play the, the music for us, and I would just like you to hear the words that the, the author has put into this hymn of How Great Thou Art. And then after hearing all of the verses, uh, then I'll be putting on the screen the refrain that you probably know very well. That sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And I ask you just to join me on that final refrain. How great thou art. O oh Lord my God, when I am awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, and I hear the rolling thunder, the power throughout the universe displayed. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, and see the brook, and feel the gentle breeze. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my blurred, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Now when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, my God, how great thou art.
liturgy for today. And I'll read the lighter colored print, and I would ask you to join with the bold white print. Lord our God, in whom we live and move and have our being, have mercy upon us. Lord our God, you do not willingly bring affliction or grief to your children. We are your peace with us. Lord our God, you have raised Christ from death as the assurance that those who sleep in death will also be raised. Blessed be our prayers. Eternal God, accept us as your children in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, who came into the world from you, was born a human being, and lived among us. He took the role of a servant and has redeemed us from all sin and from death with his holy and precious blood and with his innocent suffering and dying. Christ has done this so that we may be his own, live in his kingdom, and serve him in eternal righteousness, innocence, and happiness, since he, being risen from the dead, lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Our Savior has said, Whoever hears my words and believes the one who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has already passed from death into life. Savior of the world, lead us in the of righteousness for your name's sake. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, it is for the Lord that we live, and if we die, it is for the Lord that we die. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For Christ died, rose from death, and lives again in order to be Lord of the living and of the dead. The living Redeemer, we find our own. As a father has compassion on his children, so God has compassion on those who honor him. For he knows how we were formed. He remembers that we are dust. As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you, says the Lord. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down and sustains those who are bereaved. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. The steadfast love of the Lord lasts forever, and it endures, endures for all generations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, the world without end. One of the things about uh, times like these uh, is that it's hard to to put them all into a, a short period of time, uh, especially when when it's somebody that like Larry. Uh, it's one of those uh, when I sometimes read through the obituaries in the, in the newspaper, and sometimes it's what one little paragraph, uh, and there's nothing there. Um, then you get to somebody like Larry, and there's four pages. Uh, that seem to be everywhere, knowing everybody and doing so much. Uh, and for that, uh, the thing is, is that there's, for everything that I get to know about an individual uh, in the times that we get to be together, there's so much more that I never get a chance to hear. And so it's only been these few years that since uh, Dorothy and Larry have been part of this congregation that I got to know just a little bit about him. It's one of these things where it's, the one of the things that, uh, as it's stated, is that uh, he was someone that uh, kind of commanded the room when he came into it. Uh, it you know, it was kind of an interesting uh, feeling there, is that uh, he always had a smile. He always was there with, with some word of encouragement. Uh, Yet, you also knew that he also meant business. Uh, it's one of those things where I want to say that, that I found him to be one of those guys that could be uh, extremely tough when he needed to be, but then his grandchildren had him wrapped around their little finger. He had both of those extremes of uh, the one who got the job done, but had a heart of compassion for people. It's one where, uh, just going through some of the lists, uh, and one, I mean, I, of things that happened and things that he did, one of them also too, just by knowing that he was an educator. Uh, sometimes I just ask, what do people do and what did they like to do? 
And that tells me almost as much as I need to know about an individual. I find that people who get into the, 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 uh, yeah, the profession of teaching are people uh, that care about others. Their focus is not about themselves, but it's about, it's about someone else. You want, uh, it said that he chased down kids who didn't, call, who didn't make it to school. You know, he cared about whether or not they got their education. He did all the different things that, that he, all the things that he did seemed to be something that would benefit someone else. He just happened to be kind of an instrument that helped to get the job done. I looked at his, his career and his association with the Boy Scouts. Uh, I too am a lifelong Boy Scout, uh, Eagle Scout from the days going by. Uh, he, I, I came across that word, the silver buffalo, in there uh, and said, you know, or silver beaver, sorry about that. It's one of those things where you don't get that uh, by You don't go out and check off all the boxes to earn the badge. That is something that is that you earn by how you live and by what you do. It's an honor to bestow for your integrity and, and your service. Uh, as I as I said, and then he like I said, he just did so many things. The only thing that really seemed out of place was that he took you to a boxing match on one of your first dates. I don't know. Like you said, that's either the most insensitive thing a guy could do. <laughs> but then you said you liked it. It's one of these things where, uh, as I said, he just had so many things to know about, to know about him that he participated in. But the other part that I got to know about him from here was that he was also a man of faith. Uh, and, uh, it was his faith that helped him to get through uh, these past two and a half years. And so for that, uh, he stands as a witness to all. But rather than me talking about somebody I couldn't know, I'm going to turn this over to some people who know him far better than me. And so you said that there are three individuals that are going to be sharing this morning. I'm going to ask all three of you to come up and join me. And again, I'm going to put my mask on for my fear of all your speaking you can remove your mask. And I don't know who is designated to go first. Yep, let's step up here. Good morning. My name is Gary Walker. I'm in Friends of Africa. Over 50 years. Today is a very sad day. We're saying our final goodbyes. He was a great man, a great friend. <clears throat> well, the past few days, Thinking, what's life going to be like without Larry? And to me, it's going to be very hard, <clears throat> very difficult. When I came to church today, I saw a lot of friends, a lot of friends. If everybody here the love, we have to Larry. The love we have for this man. <clears throat> Larry was taken from us way too soon. But he had a great life. He had a fulfilled life. He had many paths in his life. He was an educator. He was an athlete. He was on more boards, more organizations, more awards. I can't even possibly begin to tell him. He even had a TV show. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and the Lord Jennifer. <laughs> that was Larry. You loved him. And if you knew Larry, you knew he loved to tell stories. The same stories. <laughs> 30, 40, 50 miles. <laughs> and every time that story got bigger and bigger. <laughs> I want to share a story with you <clears throat> that you haven't heard. This is going back a very long time. That was the AP in 72. And he went down to the district to visit Lute Sarah, the superintendent. Because they were more for Larry, the principal position at the S57. Larry called me, and we talked about it. And I said, Larry, <clears throat> you know that school has the highest student absence. The title one school is that out. I said, yes. I said, you know that the test scores are way below average? He said, yes. I said, you know the school has a 95 percentile poverty grade? He said, yes. I said, you know how hard it is to keep staff and get qualified staff to that school? He said, yes. He said, but Gary, <clears throat> Those children deserve, <clears throat> deserve better. He said, I can make a difference in that school. And boy, did he. Called me on the phone and would <clears throat> invite me to the school. He said, no, I'm not coming. <laughs> no, come. I'll give you a tour of the building. No, I'm not coming. He said, why do you breakfast? Have a lunch? No. I should have realized that he doesn't take no for an answer. <laughs> I just should have. I just said yes from the first time he offered it and went. But I ultimately went. And I went to the school. And I remember walking into the school. The lobby was quiet. The cleanliness of the school. The floors were polished. We walked through the building. Students were engaged. Teachers were teaching. We wanted to show me the bank. You've all heard of the bank. He developed that school. It was remarkable. As we were going down the stairs to visit the bank, there was this classroom that was making a lot of noise. He said, wait a minute. He opened the door. Silence. <laughs> Immediately. Silas, who's a new teacher in the classroom. And he said, I better not have to come back to this class. And he closed the door and went down to the bank. And it was remarkable what he did with this bank. He had students engaged. His tech, uh, they got scores that getting hundreds on their tests. And they, they kept the Larry in the, in the bank and said, Because they were seeing like a hundred on my test. He knew every student's name. That's cool. So I go back, and I'm in the, <clears throat> in the office. I was in the chancellor's office at the time. And I was telling the chancellor's assistant about PS57, about Larry, about the school. And I didn't think the chancellor was listening. And he said to me, what school are you talking about? I said, Pierre 57 was on Staten Island, Staten Island, what school? It's in Park Hill. He said, talk to my secretary, I want to go visit that school. I said, okay. Chancellor was in that big at the time. He said, Gary, just one thing, don't tell him I'm coming. 
I don't like principals to know when I'm visiting the school. Get a phrase, they used to clean the carpets, they used to say. So I said, no, I won't, I won't tell him. Went back to my office, I called him, I said, listen, chances <laughs> Here's my problem. I can hear him. All right, we're going to get the choir, we're going to get the marching band, we're going to get the band. We're going to get the, the advances coming, the dollars are coming. So I said to him, Larry, I don't know what day we're coming. I don't know if it's tomorrow or next day, next week. I had to confuse this because, you know, Larry. So the chancellor came two days later. And he was so impressed with that school. He was so impressed with that. He engaged the students, he listened to the teachers, got back into the car, went all the way back, and he said, This school has promise. He said, These children have a chance. Is why can't other Title I schools be like this? I said, well, no. I know that answer. He said, You do? I said, Yeah. You only have one that I've ever seen. <clears throat> so, Tom, I got back to the office. Larry called me 15 times. <laughs> I had 15 messages from Larry. So, you know, Larry is very gullible. You know what I mean? So I got him on the phone. I said, oh, man. Dude, what's the matter? I said, I have a chance going to remove you from the building. <laughs> he said, what? What? I said, Larry, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> in closing, You leave a legacy, you would be happy. Larry has left many. One of the legacies he's leaving is helping others. I can't tell you how many people he's touched, how many lives he's changed. How much money he's given out to students? How much is given to schools? <clears throat> Next year, it's going to be the 50th year for Rock and Roll. Amazing. If you know anything about it, Organizations, they see 95% last within five years, and within 10 years, the other three So 98% of charities are gone within the 10 years. Larry has us at the 50th year. And when you think of organizations, you think that there's 20 people on a, on, on a committee. It was just Larry. This was his. He did this all by himself. Remarkable. And I'm sad. I'm angry. But he's not going to be here next year. The other legacy is his family. He raped three great children. Glory, Lisa, and Larry. And he was proud of them. Glory recently graduated nursing school. Lisa followed in her father's footsteps, teacher. And he would tell me, but you were much better teacher than he was. 
and admire this one. We're so proud of him. Company, established, businessman. So hard to watch respect. And he loved his grandchildren, all of them. We love <laughs> You know, <clears throat> I would be remiss if I didn't say something about Dorothy. Larry was very sick for two and a half years. Dorothy was by his side. He slipped away. He wanted for nothing. Many trips to Snowden, many trips to the emergency room. He stayed with him at the whole house. A small, tiny apartment. And make special meals for him. Keep track of his medicines that change frequently. Extraordinary. For all those friends, we thank you, Doc. Closing, I was talking to Jay Price the other day about Larry. And we've all been asked this question. You're in a foxhole. Who would you want to be with you in that foxhole? And we always could come up with someone that you would want to be in the foxhole with. But you got to think about that. Because when you go in the foxhole, the enemy is shooting at you, and you're shooting back at the enemy. Anybody in the foxhole will do that. But you, who you want in your foxhole is when you're running out of ammunition, who's going to get out of that foxhole, go get ammunition, and come back? That's why I will learn to see what my top book. Thank you.
he wanted to tell you something. But if you think about it, in all the stories that Larry told, there was always a message. There was always a life lesson. He beat up thousands of people. But <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't beat them up because he hated them. He beat them up because he stood up for something. He respected others. He didn't care for bullying, so he protected others. Um, the honesty in him was unreal. He was the most honest person I've ever met. Uh, all the people that he introduced me to, uh, there was a history with him. I currently in a, in a job that I've been in for 30 years, and my boss is Larry's friend, who Larry introduced me to 30 years ago, and I'm still employed in the same job. Let me tell one of the Larry stories that stays close to my heart. I don't think I ever told too many people this. Larry took me everywhere. We went to Karana Club, Kiwanis Clubs, Rotary Clubs, and he always said, come on, Ken, we get a free lunch, free lunch. <laughs> so, come from Mariner's Club, it was free, he didn't need money. So when we got there, Larry would take five or ten dollars and he slipped it in my pocket. I said, what's that for? He said, just in case you want to buy rappers and they're like that, you want to do a couple. Right. So one day Larry picks me up and goes to the stand for an event. And um, Larry stops at the gas station, pulls out a card. I didn't understand credit cards, gas cards, or anything like that. And he buys gas. And then when we get to the stand, I had five dollars in my pocket, I slipped it in his pocket. So I want you to feel comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Larry cried and laughed at the same time. And that will always stay with me. Um, Gary talked about the foxhole. Um, of course, I want Larry again. Um, but you didn't have to wait for Larry to go get pulled to teach you about the hole and you go beat somebody up. So everybody was safe. I have here also something I was able to read from one of Larry's dear friends. Um, <coughs> Mr. Steer, and starts, on this day of rest, I write you all very sad news about our friend Larry, but joyful news for him. Today, Larry is resting in the arms of his maker in the eternal home he was, he, he was promised. Tomorrow, Jeff and I will drive to stand down for the viewing to honor and remember our dear, dear friend. A friend not just to us, but literally countless souls in his path course in 72 years of earthly existence. Larry was a faithful servant of Christ, reaching out his whole life to others. Devoted to his family, loyal to his friends, an educator, a mentor, exceptionally civic-minded and giving and giving. What a whole, what a role model for us. And now reaping his everlasting reward. Paraphrase Colossians 1 10, 12. Larry was made spiritually strong, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing the knowledge of God. Strengthen with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience. Joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified, who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in life. Heartfelt thanks for your, for your ongoing, fervent prayers, my dear fellow prayers, warriors. Please continue to raise to your benefit, the benefit, <coughs> beneficent Lord, the needs of Larry's Greek and wife Garden, and all their family. Thank you all. Larry was and will always be my brother from another mother, as he used to describe himself. I didn't think I didn't think we could have been closer if we were actually of the same blood. I was able to deliver the eulogy that I wrote. I wasn't able to deliver the eulogy that I wrote upon the passing of my mother. Not because I wasn't at the funeral, I was, but because I didn't think I could get through it. I'll break him down. So I asked Larry to do it for me. I guess in some ways it's just as well that I didn't be there in person today to deliver this eulogy for Larry because I knew I couldn't get through it without breaking even down either. I'm sure it's, I'm shortly to be 72. I've been a few places, I've been a few people, and I know beyond the shadow of any doubt that I have never been anyone with a bigger heart than Larry received. He gave himself in every way possible, his every way he could he was colorblind, status blind, and credo blind. If you needed help, Larry was there to help. From scouting to Rock Glory Scholarship Foundation, to Big Park and Mariners Harbor, to many others, it was the youth focused program on Staten Island that Larry was involved in. When we were in junior high school, my father <coughs> kind of intensely adopted Larry. My father grew up on Staten Island in the cold water flat in Stapleton, not so differently from the way Larry grew up. Grew up. He did well, and he had a, a pretty big heart too. One day we were still, 
one day when he's still growing up, I went to my father and asked him about how you give back. Like my father did, if you don't have very much yourself. My father's advice to Larry was to look after your own needs first, to put yourself in a position to give back when you can make a difference. Well, Larry certainly took my father's advice to heart. He made a great life for himself and Dorothy and the rest of his family, and he never, <coughs> never stopped giving back in so many ways that I fill the pages of a book if I tried to list them all. You all know that Larry loved to tell stories, and the stories about a youthful destitute with me, from me and my personal protector and force when we played basketball together at the JCC, to a uh, scurrying off show to the show one night in 1966 outside of the bar on Forest Avenue against a bunch of clueless toughs from New Jersey after they insulted Larry about his wagon sweatshirt. He was my historian. Every time we were together, he reminded me of things that we had done when we were young that I had. <laughs> that I had long forgotten, but that he took so much joy in remembering. There was a hole in my heart where Larry resided and I would never be able to fill it. But there are memories in my head of Larry that I would cherish as being among the very most the very most important to me for the rest of my life. And I know that it's the same with all of you. Let us exalt in having had the amazing good fortune to know and spend time with Larry Rosino. Let us all take what comfort we can in retaining those very special memories. Larry, Chipper, and Big Mar Big Marie made quite a team, and now together again. Rest in peace. Hi, my name is Butch Ponte. Um, this guy named Kevin Cullen. A lot of territory. Uh, I just want to share a couple of things uh, that we all knew about. Uh, you know, he was relentless. He was relentless in his pursuit of excellence for his children, his teenagers, his grown men. And Lord knows he ticked off a lot of people in the process, but he was great for thousands more. Failure was not an option for Larry. Um, it wasn't an option for him. It wasn't an option for any of his students or his kids. Our role models growing up were our mothers. Kevin mentioned briefly um, Larry's mother, Big Marie. The reason why I say Big Marie, uh, because I don't know if there was a mother in the housing projects of Manus Harbor who was more fearful than, than, uh, more fearful than she was. Way, way before the, the big edge paintings that went up all over uh, Staten Island. Um, his mother and my mother. Um, basically had uh, five boys to wrestle with, right? My three and Larry and Chipper. Um, we had two other people that influenced us tremendously, and that was Mr. Quinn at Public School 44, and Father Joe Collins, whose nickname was the Kudlum Priest of Mariners Harbor. They set the die for us. Uh, there wasn't anything uh, that we didn't think that we couldn't accomplish. Everett was always 100% all out and working and playing and living. It's the only way we knew how to live. He imprinted that whole aspect on his students, and on all of Larry's kids, teenagers and men, quite as a time by that. Families with, within one generation had a complete turnaround. And then because of the men that he impacted, who became fathers, who fearlessly took up their responsibilities as leaders and examples for all. Larry left his mom. Many of his children are in here. Many of them are 
grown and are fathers and are raising their children. Uh, just as um, Larry expected them to do. When Gary said he took over a school that was at the bottom of the pile, he wasn't kidding. Worst attendance, worst scores of any Title I school in the city of New York. And that, co that covered Brooklyn, that covered the South Bronx, uh, and it was almost a hopeless scenario. But they didn't know him. And they got to know him real quick. Uh, I remember going with him uh, and on his daily forays into uh, the Park Hill houses of the state of Tindall around the neighborhood and knocking on doors of every single student and every single family that was associated with the school. He went into every minister's church or church in the state of Tindall area and said, we have a job to do. Here's what I'm going to do. This is what you're going to do. And uh, the expressions on some of the ministers' faces were like, what the hell is this guy? <laughs> they found out real quick. Particularly when he met with the grandparents who were religious and who went to services and, and the like. And this movement started in, in that area that was uh, just absolutely uh, unstoppable uh, and incredible. What's there left to say about Larry that we all haven't heard today? How he raised his family, how he loved his wife, how he loved his grandchildren. That was a side that 99% of the people did not see that humanity, that softness. But every one of his kids, throughout the years, see him as their surrogate grandfather, surrogate father, surrogate friend, real friend. And it kind of left me thinking about what happens when all this is over. We all think, as we decide, and a lot of us don't contemplate, what are we going to do at the end? You know, how, how is this going to end? And what happens when I get before my maker? Um, what do you think he's going to say? I've come to believe that uh, when that moment comes and, and it came to Larry, The only question that I think he'll ask is he's not going to care how many church activities you missed, how many times you missed mass, how many times you missed going to services or anything else like that. He's going to ask one question. And that one question is, did you know me? Now, for some people, that's very perplexing. How do I answer that question? I'll take a little, little passage and I'll cheat a little bit by going to Mark and his, say Mark and his gospel, where uh, Jesus was speaking to the chosen ones who were chosen to come into heaven. And they were all, the entire flock was out in front of them. And as a good shepherd, he separated the sheep from the goats. And then he brought them forward. Um, he said simple things. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me into your home. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. When I was sick, you cared for me. When I was in prison, you came and visited me. So one of the righteous ones who was being spoken to in the group said, Lord, when, when, when did we, when did I do that? When did we do this? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you? 
or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality? Or naked give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And he looked at all of them and said, I tell you the truth, when you did this to one of the least of my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. I think Larry checked off all the boxes on that question. Thank you. probably don't know a lot of pastors and the time when it comes for for sermons is sometimes you never know uh, how many sermons are rewritten from the beginning of the service to the end of the service uh, and how many of the things that pastors have written uh, in preparation for their time to speak seem to become irrelevant when, they, when it comes time to say them. Uh, that's what happens during funerals. Uh, so many of the things that I would say to you today, uh, and we're also drifting on into longer than I expected, but, uh, and so therefore, uh, normally I would read to you something like the 23rd Psalm, uh, and you probably know all about the shepherd who guides. You've probably heard this passage before, uh, and said that it, it didn't matter where he walked, uh, because he knew that he had someone walking with him, and that uh, his house would be his home forever. But the one that I, one passage that I do really want to focus on today is one that just came out time and time again as I was thinking about Larry. Uh, and it was this passage from 2 Timothy, where it said, I have fought the good fight I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. Uh, and that passage comes from a larger one, and it goes like this. In the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I solemnly urge you, proclaim the message, be persistent, whether the time is favorable or unfavorable. Convince, rebuke, and encourage with the utmost patience in teaching. For the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. As, as for you, always be sober, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist carry out your ministry fully. As for me, I'm already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. From now on there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearance. I would also have shared with you a passage from the Gospel of John talking about the place of many mansions and that uh, he would show us the way to where we're going. But the thing that kept coming back to me was this passage from 2 Timothy. Uh, and it's one where when you know if you're a teacher or if you know anything else, you know that sometimes perspective uh, changes how uh, you look at it just slightly different uh, or you pronounce it just different. I mean, you know, like an aluminum can should also be an aluminum can. Uh, those kind of things, they just say, look at it slightly different. I found a slightly different translation. We always think about, I fought the good fight. It's like there's an, an adversary out there. Uh, here, when we think about Larry, we think about his, his cancer. But that's not what it's talking about. And also, too, I have finished the course that usually we think about when we come to the end of life, 
But that's not what this is about either. And it says, I have kept the faith, being faithful. But I found it different. It said, I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I kept my faith. One of the things that I have heard many times in many places is that whole idea, you know, what was it, um, as we were looking, thinking and hearing about, um, yeah, forget that part. Just when you get to this where you're saying, sometimes I like the way this is says, I have fought a good fight. Uh, that sounds like Larry. Uh, sometimes there were fights worth fighting. They were good causes. They were good reasons. And each of those things that he fought for, he went at it and gave it a good fight. Yes, he also gave the cancer a good fight too. And I don't necessarily, and sometimes I say it's uh, not necessarily that the cancer beat him, because I don't think it did. It might have taken his body, but it didn't change Larry. Every time I saw him, he was just willing to keep on fighting because that's what it was. He just said, it's a fight. And the only way you fail is when you don't try. I think that's the thing that I saw in Larry. It wasn't about, about what was going on. It's not what should I do, it's, but it's like saying uh, impossible wasn't in his vocabulary. He never asked why. He said, why not? And he sought to make that why not become reality. Also, too, I've heard you uh, talk about the stories. Let me tell you, I've, I keep telling a lot of people about the stories that, that are in my family. I have one story about my dad. My, his, his aunt told it to me every time we met. It was about the time when my dad was just a boy under 10 years old. Uh, he had been given a nickel to walk down to the local tavern to get my grandfather a pumpkin of beer. And, but along the way back home, somehow the wagon that my dad was pulling tipped over and spilled the bucket. And my, his aunt delighted in telling me that she had to give my dad a nickel to go back and get a refill. I tell you that story, and I tell you this is to say that, you know, I know that story because number one, she told it to me so many blasted times. And it's the only story that anybody told me about my dad and how he was growing up. You have your Larry stories. And yes, he told them 20, 30, 40 times. But the thing is, is that I know I remember my stories when they're told. The reason why you remember your stories of Larry is because I told them so many times. And those stories become part of you. And those stories become a part of, of your relationships. Those stories reinforce the lessons that he taught you. You know, I lived in Wisconsin. I grew up there. I still have my Wisconsin Badger stuff, and yes, I have a Packer cheese head in my office. Because the, the story goes is you can take the boy out of Wisconsin, but you can't take the Wisconsin out of the boy. And I think the same thing goes for Larry, is to say, yes, Larry can be gone from our midst, but Larry is not really gone. Larry is with you in every single one of those stories. And if you didn't get the lesson by now, he might come back and really have another good fight with him. I think he's the kind that said, if you saw, if he was looking down on us and he saw us and they're looking at a need that needed to be done and we could do something about it, and we were just sitting here lamenting that Larry wasn't here to do it, he'd be angry with us because he would say, that's not what I taught you. If you see something that needs to be done, do it. Don't wait for me to do it. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. If you can do something about it, you do it. Now, races are interesting. Now, to me, I just got done watching the, the, the latest of the Indianapolis 500. 
one of the most anticlimactic races that I have seen in a long time. After 500, no, actually after 497 miles, there was a yellow flag called at the very end, and all these race cars that instead of going 200 miles around the track, all pulled up side by side in a line and they cruised across the finish line at 125 with no racing. It ended uh, without finishing. I think it's one of the things where there are races that we have, and, and you know what's going to happen next year? There's going to be another race. I don't think we are done with our races. I think we are a series of races that we run. There isn't just one. There's a multiple. And so for us, it's time to keep on running that race, the one we're in now, and seeing it through to this finish. Larry took on the challenge of that one school, and he ran that race and got to the end of that one, and he picked up another one. That was the challenge. But I like that, the last one, it says, rather than I kept the faith, he said, I kept my faith. It's one of these things where when you look at all the bad things in the world, when you look at schools that are underperforming, when you see kids that are suffering because of their circumstances, when you see needs of people that are not being addressed, it can be easy to lose faith. But to persevere, to continue on, that's keeping the faith. That's keeping my faith. It's what gets me up in the morning and what, it's what keeps me going. And as I said early today, the reason why I can continue to keep running that race and to keep my faith is knowing that I'm not making that journey alone. That God is going with me. And that God has a place that's prepared for me. Now I've told many people before, says, I don't know what heaven's going to really be like, but the one thing I know is that it's not going to be a place of a lot of floating clouds with me sitting around. Like a hawk. I think that would be nonsense. And sometimes we think about all the things that we would do and say, well, I'm a golfer. So they say, oh, the heaven is just endless golf courses. I mean, that would get rather boring. I have a tendency of thinking that when I get there, God's going to have a job for me to do. I don't know what that is, but I think that there's more purpose left. And I have a sneaky feeling that that God has already put Larry to work. Uh, he said, what challenge do you have for me now? Where can I go? What can I do? How can I help you? And that's the kind of faith you hear what he had, where he's always looking for a way to help. It's one of these things where as we come to this time, at the end of our, our journey here, uh, we need to remember to take those stories, take those lessons, keep his faith before you. And then rather than lamenting that he's not here, remember that he is still here. He's still here. He's still here. And he's in the lives of every one of those students that he touched. He's in, in the lives of all those scouts that he inspired. He's in the lives of all those organizations that he guided. He is not gone. He's still active in our midst. Let us continue to continue to remember Larry, all that he taught us, but also remembering his faith. Amen. Before we head to the, the grave site, I do have just one last hymn for us to remember. Uh, it's, it's a little bit sooner than I wanted to. Uh, it's the hymn Rock of Ages, and once again, I'm just going to uh, read the hymn for you. Uh, and then when we get to the end, I'm going to, there's three verses, I'm going to read all three, but then at the end, I want you to join me in singing just the third verse. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide my 
myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy your wounded side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save, save from wrath and make me pure. Not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's commands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must sin, and thou alone. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Thank you. 